Don't look now, but the New Orleans Saints might be embracing a little bit of a soft rebuild. We got all that and a little bit of Lanyap for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdet Nation and Houdet family? I am your host, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert and credentialed member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, it's a big day. Chase Young expected to visit with the New Orleans Saints today, but I'll tell you why you shouldn't expect him to sign right away. We're going to get to the Nathan Peterman uh, signing, which might be one of the least exciting signings that we've seen in New Orleans in the recent past. We're going to lead everything off with wide receiver Cedric Wilson, whose signing might not be splashy, but it's certainly a necessary one and kind of gives us the idea that the Saints might be embracing a little bit of a soft rebuild here. We'll explain all of that in today's episode. We appreciate you very much for being an everydayer and for having us as your first listen every day here on the Locked on Saints podcast as a part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers will get $200 in bonus bets by simply winning your first $5 bet. All you got to do is head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So the New Orleans Saints look like they might be embracing a little bit of a soft rebuild here. Not a full tear it down to the studs and rebuild it, but certainly taking the opportunity to rebuild their depth. We discussed in yesterday's episode about how this team has allowed a lot of its outgoing free agents, which haven't been A-tier free agents for the most part, uh, but, you know, they kind of let those guys end up going out. They're signing elsewhere. Lonnie Johnson Jr. goes elsewhere. Uh, Zach Bond goes elsewhere. Malcolm Roach goes elsewhere. And then now we're seeing the Saints bring in a lot of sort of mid-level signings. Now, I would elevate Willie Gay a little bit. And by the way, we spoke with Willie Gay during his introductory press conference on Zoom yesterday on Thursday, and he is in infectious. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. We'll get to some of that later on, either in the weekend or getting into next week. But I want to highlight the Cedric Wilson signing from Thursday evening. So if you missed it, the New Orleans Saints signed uh, former Miami Dolphins and Dallas Cowboys wide receiver Cedric Wilson to a two-year deal. We don't know the terms of that two-year deal just yet. I expect it's not a, a, mild, a wildly expensive deal. This is very reminiscent of when the Saints brought in Kirk Merritt, not just because Kirk Merritt was also a former Dolphin, but bringing him in and signing him to a two-year deal as opposed to just a one-year deal all these other things. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it certainly gives you a little bit of the the feeling that the Saints intend for Cedric Wilson to be a part of their plans here in 2024. And I think that's the part that kind of clues the soft rebuild for you. It feels like the New Orleans Saints are rebuilding their depth and rebuilding the middle of their roster through free agency with then saving themselves the opportunity to build their future through the draft. And this is what rebuilding or soft retooling, however it is that you want to look at it, teams go about things. Now, a full-on rebuilding team would be looking for a bunch of starters in the draft. That won't be the Saints by the time that they get to the draft. In fact, right now, they're not even really looking for many starters. Maybe the offensive line is the only place where you're really having that conversation. But secondary-wise, maybe safety, maybe not, because you've also got Jordan Howden there. Uh, you know, corner wise, there's pretty good, assuming that they don't trade away Marshawn Lattimore. Even then, they have perimeter starters in the building. Defensive line, linebacker, their starters. Offensive line, maybe you're asking the question about left guard, but technically, the Saints could have their same starting five this year that they had at the beginning of last year. Running back, quarterback, wide receiver, tight end, they're all kind of set in terms of what the starters are. Now you're building out the depth. And I think that Cedric Wilson might not be the flashiest signing, might not be the sexiest signing, might not be the splashiest signing, but he is somebody that I think could contribute for the New Orleans Saints, particularly if you look back in 2021. 2021 was his final season with the Dallas Cowboys, his best season. 45 catches, 602 yards, six receiving touchdowns. And he did a lot of that out of the slot, played 580-ish snaps out of the, or you know, as a whole on offense. 500 of those came from the slot during the regular season that year. And he did a really good job attacking the middle of the field. He does a very good job just taking a quick look at his tape 
of you know running sort of those routes to the middle of the field and you read the leverage of where the linebacker is so then maybe you move a little bit towards the inside if the linebacker is giving outside leverage if the linebacker is giving inside leverage you start to break it back outside kind of like an option route but really just feeling zone coverage is really more more what it is it does a very good job with that so attacking the middle of the field a good red zone threat continuously finds himself open, works himself open against zone coverage. These are all things that New Orleans Saints love in a wide receiver. And in some cases, like attacking the middle of the field, need from their wide receiver core and absolutely need from their offense. That was such a big area of the field. They just kind of didn't attack very much or not as much as you would expect an NFL team to do so during the 2023 season. It's clear that that is set to change here in 2024. Uh, six foot two, about 200 pounds, four, five, five speed. He's not the fastest, like blazingest guy in the world, but he doesn't have to be either. The Saints wanted a possession receiver and they want a slot receiver. I would imagine this guy kind of gives you a little bit of both 66% career catch percentage doesn't have a ton of concerning drops on his ledger. He's not going to be a thousand yard receiver. He's not going to be your new wide receiver one, but he is going to be a guy based on this two-year contract that apparently is in the vision and in the plans for the New Orleans Saints as an additional piece. Saints right now only have four wide receivers now, including Cedric Wilson, on their roster, meaning they still have a ton of work to do in that room. Hunter Renfro, whoever else it is that you want to look at. Alan Lazard right now is being shot by the, the, the New York Giants. We just watched Keenan Allen Thursday night get traded for a fourth-round selection. Alan Lazard has to be able to be moved for less than that. The Saints have four fifth-round picks. Tell me that you can't get into that conversation. You know what I mean? So there's ways. Or if you don't find a trade partner, if you're the New York Jets, do you just release Alan Lazard? If so, boom, there's an opportunity there. So Saints are far from done. This doesn't, this isn't a signing that makes them go, huh, we did it. We free agencyed. Like they're not done here, right? This is though a signing that I don't think is a meaningless one, nor do I think that it's a world shaking one. It's a solid signing for a depth wide receiver. And if these are the types of signings that the Saints are focusing on, that kind of gives you that entry, kind of gives you that insight. It might be a little bit of a soft rebuild for right now and that they're comfortable with that, with that, with, with what is at, excuse me, the top of their roster. And now they're looking to build out what the middle of their roster is, the depth of their roster, all of those extra pieces. And I think that Cedric Wilson does help you do that. Uh, for those of you that are part of the Locked on Saints insider program, I'll have a film study on Cedric Wilson tomorrow, mostly looking at the type of routes that he ran when he was in uh, Dallas, and then what happened to him over the course of the last two years in Miami. And just to give you like a quick preview of that, the fact of the matter is that Miami, first of all, buried him, right? Because he ended up having this great season in 2021, signed a new deal. It was a three-year deal with the Miami Dolphins in 2022 lived two of those years with Miami and then eventually was moved on from. There were some trade rumors around him. They took him from out of the slot, moved him out wide, and then in 2023 had him play the most run blocking snaps he's ever been asked to play in his entire career, over 240 of them things to only 320 routes run. So they really, really moved him away from the receiver category. And I think that his intent with coming here to New Orleans is that maybe he gets a little bit more back involved as a pass catcher. And that could be good news, not only for Cedric Wilson, but for the New Orleans Saints as well, who are looking for an additional complimentary option to go with their top guys in Chris Olave, Rashid Jaheed, and A.T. Perry. Maybe Cedric Wilson is that guy, maybe not. But I'll tell you what, it's a pretty solid signing. It's a nice signing for what the New Orleans Saints are looking for, apparently, in this year's free agency class. Coming up next, one of the things that the New Orleans Saints have been looking for this offseason is a new backup quarterback. And Nathan Peterman might be one of the most uninspiring signings that we have seen the new in New Orleans Saints free agency in quite a while. Let me explain to you why, what the role is, and why Peterman. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Did you know that even if you have a 401k, you can still get an IRA? Well, Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar that you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is also boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right. No cap on that 3% match. Robinhood gets you the most out of your retirement. 
thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing includes risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of your first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. All right, family. Nathan Peterman is very likely one of the most uninspiring signings we have seen in New Orleans free agency in quite some time. So why make that move? That's what we got coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. We appreciate you very much for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to also go and check out Locked on Sports today. It's the nas- it's the first ever national sports 24-7 stream on YouTube. And if you're a baseball fan, you won't want to miss it. March 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern time is the best MLB season preview that you're going to find. Again, that is March 20th. 7 p.m. Eastern time, you'll be able to be one of the first to catch it as it drops over at Locked On Sports today. Include all of the insight from all of our MLB local experts. You can find it on the Locked On Sports today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube as well as the free Amazon TV channels app. All right, so when we look at the signing of Nathan Peterman, it was easily one of the most hotly, I don't even want to call it debated. It was just kind of hotly hated amongst the New Orleans Saints fan base. And look, I understand the reasoning behind it. Objectively, objectively, if it wasn't for Christian Hackenberg, Nathan Peterman would be one of the most unsuccessful or the most unsuccessful quarterback I've ever watched play in the NFL. His 39.4 pass rating is the lowest amongst all active quarterbacks with at least 100 pass attempts. So why sign Nathan Peterman? Well. We discussed this a little bit a couple of days ago when we were talking about guys that could potentially come in and take over as the backup quarterback now that Jameis Winston is a Cleveland Brown. And remember that the role of the backup quarterback 90% of the time isn't what you do on the field. It's what you do on the sideline for the guy that is on the field. And Nathan Peterman has experience because of his years with the Las Vegas Raiders with Derek Carr. And he also has experience from his time Uh, in Chicago, working with new quarterback coach for the Saints, Andrew Janoco. So there's familiarity. So here we are again, the familiarity conversation for the New Orleans Saints. And I'm going to be honest, as much as I look at Nathan Peterman and say, boy, I hope he never hits the field. I understand the impetus behind saying this is the right fit for right now. He's going to compete with Jake Hayner. I will be genuinely surprised if he makes the 53-man roster by the time that training camp is all said and done. And look, I'm not sitting here trying to hate on this guy, all right? I'm just being realistic about what my expectations are. If those expectations get exceeded, fantastic. But I think a lot of people reacted to this signing as if the backup quarterback was supposed to be the guy that got your starting quarterback benched. And that's not the case. And I also know that there are a lot of people who have also mentioned that Jameis Winston was too much of a threat to Derek Carr and the New Orleans Saints, so they went with somebody that's not as much of a threat. And I can't stress enough how much Jameis Winston was never a threat to Derek Carr nor the New Orleans Saints coaching staff or anything like that when it comes to taking over as a starting quarterback. That was the fans that wanted that. The organization, the coaching staff, Derek Carr never looked at Jameis Winston as a guy that could potentially take over as a starter no matter how bad Derek Carr played. Now, you can decide whether or not that's the right or wrong choice. But I'm just telling you the reality. No team, nobody on the team was worried about that. So I think that the signing around Nathan Peterman is all about his connection and his existing relationship with Derek Carr and his connection and his existing relationship with Andrew Janoko. That's what I think that this all comes down to. And so what value does that have? I think that the value is what happens during training camp up until the season begins. And so while that competition is happening between Nathan Peterman and Jake Hayner, which I would expect Jake Hayner to win that competition, 
the value of a Nathan Peterman is that he helps you sort of be able to bridge the gap between Derek Carr and Andrew Janoko. He helps you be able to speak the same language as Derek Carr to help Derek Carr continue to develop and adjust to this new system. I get it. I completely understand it. But it is one of the most underwhelming signings we have seen from the New Orleans Saints in quite some time. Even in moments where they've gone out there and they found backup quarterbacks and things like that. And I'm talking about offseason moves. You know, they, when they went and signed like Jake Luton and everything in season, obviously that didn't really move the needle for them. But I was talking about offseason signings while everybody's, you know, signing Danelle Hunter to multi year deals and trading for Rondale Moore and signing franchise quarterbacks and trading for Keenan Allen and signing Hollywood Brown and all these. While all these other big, 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 big moves are happening, usually at least what the Saints are doing has some whelm to it. This is massively underwhelming or even unwhelming, if that is such a thing. And so again, I understand that, but I do see the vision, not the vision. There's no vision in terms of what this is, but I see the, and when I say that there's no vision, I mean vision being like what you can see happening on the field. Like the idea here is that Nathan Peterman never touches the field. The idea here is instead that he ends up helping to further install the system for the quarterback, translate for the quarterback, be the go-between, help the quarterback have another pair of eyes with a guy that he's already familiar with. So you look at the quarterback room, Derek Carr and Nathan Peterman have played together. They were together over in Las Vegas. Derek Carr and Jake Hayner, while Jake Hayner was a student and was playing as you know a collegiate football player, college quarterback over at Fresno State, he was constantly in touch with Derek Carr. Derek Carr was his mentor effectively, right? So you can see that, okay, now you have this super cohesive quarterback room. And maybe that if there was any type of rift that now gets patched up because everybody knows everybody. And maybe that is a part of the impetus too. But I think most importantly is, can these people not just get along? No one cares if they get along. Everyone cares if they can play football. And I think that maybe there is some piece to the familiarity between Peterman and Carve that maybe helps that happen. But I don't truly expect Peterman to make it through training camp and be on the 53-man roster. I genuinely think that one of the things that the New Orleans Saints should consider doing if he doesn't get signed before the fact is wait for Jimmy Garoppolo's two-game suspension to be up and then sign him. Because at that point, your one-year deal doesn't matter. It's not guaranteed. Then at least you get a guy that goes out there, doesn't have the worst um, passer rating amongst all active quarterbacks that have thrown at least 100 passes and has played in a similar system and all these other things. And so I do think that there is something to that plan that could potentially get set into motion when the time is right. But signing him before he you know, undergoes his suspension, that timing might not yet be right. So they might wait until that's done. And if you wait until after week one, then the contract's not guaranteed. So maybe Nathan Peterman does make the roster on the 53, but then the Saints could potentially make a different decision later on. And I still think that C.J. Beathard, if he loses the camp battle over in Jacksonville to Mac Jones, which would genuinely surprise me, could also become an option for the Saints earlier than the first week of the season. So I, I do think that there will be other options out there that might end up drawing the Saints' attention. And I don't really feel like Nathan Peterman ends up landing long term um, or for longer than his role, which is to help translate things, help Derek Carr see things, give Derek Carr another pair of eyes and somebody that he's familiar with. I could be wrong. And if that's the case, you just hope that it doesn't hit the field. But outside of that, as underwhelming as it is, I assume that there is a purpose. And that's the one purpose that I can kind of scrounge up here. But no doubt about it. You hope that he never hits the field. Coming up next, the New Orleans Saints, a guy that they'd love to have on the field for them going into 2024 is defensive end Chase Young. He's set to visit on Friday. We're going to break that down. And the New Orleans Saints already have one top 30 visit scheduled with a draft prospect, a young running back. We got that coming up for you as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Say goodbye to all of the busted brackets because our friends over at FanDuel are going to let you bet on every single game in this year's NCAA tournament. So whether you're betting on a big upset or a number one seed, go dancing on America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers 
can get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks you can spend on point spreads, money lines, and even who you think will win it all. And to that point, right now, FanDuel has UConn as the top odds in the men's basketball championship to win it all at plus 450, right behind them are the Houston Cougars at 600. Purdue is right behind them at plus 800, with Arizona and Tennessee pulling up the rear there in the top five at plus one, uh, plus 14 and plus 1600. So you want to check out all that, you can find it all at FanDuel.com slash locked on, where you can go and bet on all college hoops until they cut down the nets. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Chase Young is scheduled to visit today, but I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't expect a contract to be done today, despite all of that. Don't forget, we are your team every day. So we'll be back on Monday at the very latest to bring you everything you need to know about getting you all caught up from free agency. But of course, if any big news breaks, We'll be right here with you all throughout the weekend as well. So make sure you check that out. If you want more, you can join the Locked on Saints Insider Program at five by texting Houdat to 504-285-7473 or visiting joinsubtext.com. So Locked on Saints, you can take part in our film studies. I'll have a Cedric Wilson film study out later on today. And I'm still working on Hunter Renfro, Chase Young as well, but definitely would get those wrapped up when those go from potential signings to uh, for sure, signings or realistic signings should that happen. And with Chase Young, that's absolutely one that you want to happen with the New Orleans Saints, that the New Orleans Saints would like to see happen. Although they do have other options. The Baltimore Ravens moving on from Tyus Bowser certainly opens up more possibilities for the New Orleans Saints. He's kind of a Josh Uche type who, of course, ended up sticking around in New England. But I understand the pursuit of a Chase Young, right? Um, you know, uh, destructive player, great pass rusher, good speed rusher, and all those kinds of things. He's got concerns. Don't be wrong. Every player has things to improve, get better at, adjust, all these other things. And if you get him in the right room, you get him around the right players, then those things kind of happen. But so all of it starts today. Um, he will be visiting the New Orleans Saints on Friday per Nick Underhill confirmed uh, elsewhere. And I think that the thing that I want to stress here is not to expect, it, it is rather to not kind of build that expectation of like, well, the Saints shouldn't let him leave the facility without a contract or without signing a deal and all those other things. He's probably going to leave without signing a deal. Um, we're seeing this less and less and less uh, with NFL players on a visit agreeing to terms on a contract. We used to see that a little bit, you know, in other places. There was that one time where Forgive me for bringing up his name, but there was that one time that like Jared Cook, like he like went missing for a little while, like nobody knew where he was. Like he came to New Orleans, and everybody was like, "Uh, is Jared okay?" And then you know he posted something like back at home with his kids and stuff like that, and everything was fine. But you know, back in the day, back back in the day, um, you know, there were these it, you know, these situations where like somebody just gets locked down, like right there, like they go to the facility and and that's it. Uh, players are being urged to do that less and less and less and less by their representation, especially in this case. You already know that Chase Young has another visit lined up. He'll be visiting with the Tennessee Titans after he visits with the New Orleans Saints. He had his visit on Wednesday with the Carolina Panthers, left the Carolina Panthers without a deal. DJ Wonham ended up getting a contract with the Carolina Panthers, and the Panthers are now hosting also Jadavion Clowney, or, or hosted, visited with uh, Jadavion Clowney. So the Carolina Panthers want to sign two of those three guys, basically, or two edge rushers, because they lost two, Frankie Luvu, as well as, well, <laughs> they lost Frankie Luvu. They traded away Brian Burns 16 months late and for way less selections, better trade capital than they would have gotten had they said yes 16 months ago to the Los Angeles Rams when they offered two first round picks and instead they trade them to the New England Patriots for a second and a fifth, which is just, you know, say lobby, right? It is what it is. That's their problem, not yours. And so I, I think that the thing that is important to me is that you don't get your hopes up around the idea that, all right, he's going to show up in the in the facility and then sign a contract. Like, don't let him leave the building. He's probably going to leave the building. Like nine times out of 10, he's going to leave the building because rep, reps don't want their players to just agree to contracts these days. And so the big question around all of this is going to be the money. Um, if Chase Young is looking for a starting role, then he's going to want starter money. The New Orleans Saints do not have a starting role to offer him. Cam Jordan, Carl Granderson, those are going to be the starters at defensive end on either side. Now, you can offer him and tell him that, you know, the plan is that he'll be a part of a rotation and all these other things and that he will 
get ample opportunity, which he will. Everybody in the New Orleans Saints defensive line gets opportunity. It's one of the reasons why defensive linemen have continued to come here up until uh, apparently this offseason. But even him just agreeing to take the, even him just agreeing to take the visit, he's got to know Cam Jordan and Carl Granderson are there, right? So clearly there's some version of all of this that works for him. But if the money that he wants is starter money, but the role that he gets in New Orleans is rotational role, the money is not going to match what he wants. The reality is not going to match the desire, and therefore he's going to go to Tennessee and see what they have to offer, which is the right thing to do. And then there might be more visits that end up popping up, right? He might not want to sign with any of the three teams that he's met with by the time that he's done with the Tennessee Titans. We'll see how things go. Now, the Saints have had a pretty steady track record of players visiting and actually signing, not at the moment that they visit, but coming back and signing and doing all of those other things. Um, will this be that case? I don't know. The, the, the money conversation is a bit concerning for me. And it's not that I'm worried about the Saints overpaying. It's not that I'm worried about their salary cap space. They'll, they'll be fine. Like they'll, They won't do anything that they can't manage, uh, especially with Kai but, or Kai Harley. But like the thing that I do have my concerns about is what is he asking for? What is the role that would necessitate that payment? And does that role match the role that he would get in New Orleans? And therefore, if not, what does the payment look like and how distant are the two in terms of how they see how much should be paid. This is where we get back to like the Caden Ellis conversations, the Chauncey Garner Johnson conversations and stuff like that. What role are you playing in this system and what how much you get paid might be different than what role you're playing in another system and what you would then be paid based on what your role is. So that would be my biggest concern. And I think that with all of the contracty goodness that comes with all of that, right? The contracty curiousness that comes with all that, um that uh, that kind of breeds a little bit of contempt, right? Like that breeds a little bit of like, ah, this is going to be one of those weird ones. <laughs> so we'll see how it all plays out. We'll see where it goes. I don't see the Saints and Chase Young seeing eye to eye contract wise and role wise, uh, therefore, but we never say never in the NFL. So we'll see how things go when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. Um, lastly, what I wanted to mention was Dylan Lauby. So this is the running back from uh, New Hampshire. Um, small school prospect, versatile, does it all five foot 10, 204 pounds, had a pretty respectable four, five, three, 40 yard dash when he was at the combine, uh, can catch and run. He's a pretty good runner. He's a zone scheme runner. He's not much of an elusive guy in terms of having sort of those like big bounce moves and things like that, but he can be a little bit of a one cut dude. Um, and he has the speed to still get away. Uh, when guys are behind him, but he is set to visit the New Orleans Saints on a top 30 visit. So to define what a top 30 visit is, NFL teams get 30 visits where they can have a prospect come to their facility. They can go and visit as many players at their facilities and all that other stuff as they want, but they can only have 30 actually come to their facility. Top 30 is a little bit of a misnomer. It doesn't actually mean that they see this player as a top 30 player or a top 30 draft pick or anything like that. It's just the phrasing. It's just what the verbiage is. So they're having him in on a top 30 visit, which does tend to express some interest. Now, that interest can diminish after they've met with the player at their facility. That interest can deepen after they've met with that player at the facility. But it is an interesting one because I do think that the Saints should be at least exploring the opportunity to bring in some potential running back talent if it makes sense. They shouldn't push themselves to do it, but if it makes sense to add to Alvin Kamara and Kendra Miller and Jamal Williams, who all have roles in this Clint Kubiak offense, but if you're looking for somebody that's young and that you can bring in and kind of add to all of this, then I think that there's value in doing that in this year's draft. Guys like Dylan Lowby, guys like Kamani Vidal out of Troy, Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue, Cody Schrader out of Iowa, if I remember correctly. And then, of course, uh, is it Iowa? I'm pretty sure it was Iowa. Uh, and then, of course, um, Isaac Guerrero coming out of Louisville. Like all of these guys fit in terms of what the New Orleans Saints new system is going to look like. So cool to see that that visit is coming together for New Orleans. All right, y'all, we appreciate you very much for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. The LSU Tigers. Men's basketball team got an early exit when it came to the NCAA tournament. You want to hear more about it, you can go and check out Locked on LSU today. Don't forget to also go and check out Locked on Pelicans with our good friend Jake Madison. Appreciate you very much as always, y'all. 
for making Locked on Saints part of your day, part of your routine, for saying yes to me on the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're moming them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.